episode 177 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Molecular Mechanisms of Differentiation, with Dr. Ludovic Vallier. Hey everybody, this is Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. Want to listen to all the papers discussed in each episode? Subscribe to our newsletter and you'll get a summary of each episode, including links to interview and roundup papers delivered straight to your inbox each time a new episode comes out. Today, we have Dr. Ludovic Vallier from the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute. He's on the podcast to talk about his research on the mechanisms controlling the differentiation of pluripotent stem cells into endoderm progenitors. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news coming right up. But first, as research using pluripotent stem cells advances towards the clinic, there's a renewed focus on cell quality. Visit www.stemcell.com slash cell quality to explore ways to assess your human pluripotent stem cells and learn about essential quality attributes to consider for gene editing, disease modeling, and cell maintenance. Yeah, talking about the clinic uh, and application of induced pluripotent stem cells, I've got a story here from Nature Medicine, what, which was like, you know, it's, it's the first of its type, I think, and uh, it's a watershed for the field. This is from John Rasco, uh, who is at uh, Australia, New South Wales University in Australia. Um, and the study here was an application of iPS-derived mesenchymal stromal cells. You know, we talk about mesenchymal stem cells. There's a long history, some darkness there, but now they've come into the light again. And it's clearly recognized that mesenchymal stem cells promote an immunosuppressive and immunoregulatory effect by secreting cytokines and chemokines and growth factors and all kinds of other stuff, you know, vesicles, all that stuff. Um, and they can provide this immunomodulatory effect in the context of like graft first host disease, for example. Uh, they also lack human leukocyte antigen class two antigen expression, meaning that they can evade the immune surveillance, right? So you can administer them allogeneically without any kind of donor recipient matching even. Um, so there's a, a lot of reasons why MSCs have value now, even though in dark days there was a lot of people hating on them. Um, but the, the problem is uh, that while primary derived MSCs, you can get them from a lot of places, the bone marrow, adipose tissue, umbilical cord, placenta, they're safe, they're well tolerated, but scaling them up from an individual donor, it's tough. And there's a lot of variability between donors in how well they kind of modulate the immune environment, how well they suppress T cell proliferation, et cetera. Um, and also, as you expand them, it's been shown that uh, you can you can have reduced activity. Not to mention that like every time you want to administer these things, having to go one off with that patient and expand their own autologous MSCs, it's you know, it's a burden. It's cumbersome. It's, there's a lot of opportunity for individual operator error there. Uh, there may be some variability between these patients. Cut to the chase, right? It'd be great if we could get a, a real scalable source, and this is induced pluripotent stem cells, right? They have the potential to overcome all these challenges. And for this reason, Rasco and his group, they have commenced the human clinical trials of iPS-derived cells. Um, they call them these CYP001, CYP001 uh, IPS-derived MSCs. They're created using this GMP manufacturing process. And what they did here in this study is in this limited phase one op open-label clinical trial. They took just 16 subjects, one of whom dropped out. So they had seven and eight subjects in two groups. One of the groups had uh, a million cells per kilogram with a limit of 100 million cells administered, and the other had twice that dose. Uh, and the real objective here, as most phase one trials, is just to look at safety and tolerability. And they looked at the, uh, a few measures, complete response, overall response, overall survival, and found that there were no uh, adverse events, no serious adverse events that were observed. And the overall response, the complete response, and the overall survival at day 100 post-administration were 86 
percent, 53 percent and 87 percent, respectively. So bottom line, I mean, uh, who knows how that compares to a control group? They weren't doing any kind of placebo here. Um, but uh, this is Im important. I mean, this is an important application um, in, I should say, in treating uh, steroid, non-steroid responsive graft first host disease. Uh, showing that it can be tolerated. And, and the next steps, I think, are to see how effective it is. Um, and if we can get there, I think we could have an unlimited source. Uh, it would be the real first, the first real kind of off-the-shelf treatment of induced pluripotent stem cells that could really have widespread application. Yeah, this is somewhat of a landmark study, right? It's a report of a completed human clinical trial using iPS-derived cells. So it's been 15 years since iPSCs were first developed. So uh, this is really a landmark paper because we want to get to this point. We want to, we've always wanted to get to this point when it comes to the, tr the clinical translation of these cells. And certainly there has been an evolution in the acceptability of MSCs over the years. But, you know, I think these folks did a pretty decent job in demonstrating that, yes, there is a therapeutic benefit. One thing they alluded to here is that the iPS-derived MSCs might be used in the future for a range of other clinical targets. So they might have future data on the utility of these cells for, you know, say, critical limb ischemia or asthma or maybe organ transplant rejection. So uh, stay tuned to see what, you know, what these iPS-derived MSCs might focus on next. And of course, there are a number of other iPSC-derived clinical, you know, cellular products that are in the works, you know, treating macular degeneration, you know, iPS cardiomyocytes for heart failure, Parkinson's disease, and so on. So this is a landmark study, but certainly not the last study using iPSCs for clinical translation and clinical purposes. Yeah, but I think it's ironic because, you know, when cell therapy first uh, was in the spotlight, everyone was talking about MSCs for everything. MSCs for that, still. People mm -hmm. are, are, you know, peddling these BS claims with MSCs of other origin. And I think it's ironic that the first IPS derived application that really is, you know, as you said, reaching this landmark threshold is making them into these kind of catch all cells. So we've come full circle. Um, but as you said, the, the journey's only just begun. MSCs get their moment in the sun and sticking with the mesoderm here, we're going to talk about a paper that's coming out of the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute, coming from an old friend of mine, actually, Wes McKeithen, over in Mark McCullough's lab. He's actually moved on to do a postdoc at UCSF now. The title of this paper is Engineering, or sorry, Re-Engineering, an Antiarrhythmic Drug Using Patient IPSC Cardiomyocytes to improve therapeutic potential and reduce toxicity. This is a cell stem cell paper. So the bottom line here is there is a drug out there called mixilatine, which is a decent antiarrhythmic, but uh, there are, these folks are trying to show that um, we can use IPS cardiomyocytes, and in particular patient-specific IPS cardiomyocytes, to develop an optimized version of this drug called mixilatine. And the patient-specific cells they're using were from individuals who have long QT syndrome. It's a heart rhythm disorder that can cause fast, chaotic heartbeats and represents a leading cause of sudden death in younger people. Without therapy, long QT syndrome has a pretty high mortality rate within a single year. And uh, with, with treatment, mortality is pretty significantly decreased. You can manage it pretty well, down to about 1% over the course of 15 years. So mixilatine is an example of a drug that can stabilize the heart rhythm. And it's considered to be pretty good, a decent therapy for certain forms of long QT syndrome. But while it's good at stabilizing the heart rate, it's not without certain side effects. And it could be a little bit more effective. So what Wes and and colleagues using IPS cardiomyocytes, especially from patients with long QT, long QT syndrome, and uh, we're basically conducting a massive screen to identify optimized versions of mixilatine. And ultimately, that is what they did. They were able to find a number of structural analogs that were more effective in, than mixilatine. And they also used iPSCs from healthy folks to actually test to see if there were any unwanted side effects. They 
found, like I mentioned, four or five different versions of the mixolatine, optimized mixolatine. And I think the the next obvious thing is to see if these things are really effective in an in vitro setting, something that we were discussing, you know, before the podcast. Obvious next step is to see if they're just as effective in an in vivo setting. You got to bring this to a mouse model before you want to actually take these refined versions of mixolatine to the clinic. And I'm sure they've they've thought about that. I'm sure this is something that's in the works. Um, one thing to mention here um, is that, of course, IPS cardiomyocytes, if we're going to talk about these cells, we're going to talk about their immaturity. But Wes and colleagues had a great approach and a great angle to actually addressing that whole immaturity problem. If you're finding these optimized versions of mixilatine, um, you have to consider it in the context of these immature cells, which may ha not have the right ion channels that you would find in adult cardiomyocytes. But Wes actually had a paper a few weeks ago, I think about a month ago, that came out in Cell Reports, where they were using a very simplified approach to maturing IPS cardiomyocytes with a um, and a um, metabolically optimized cell culture media, basically low glucose and uh, extended treatment with this low glucose cell culture media. And over the course of a month, you can get really pretty good looking IPS cardiomyocytes. And so this is the media that they're actually using in this particular study as well. So, you know, Wes is kind of on a roll. He's got a bunch of papers in the works and this is the the fruit of his labor. It's uh, It's cool to see that you know, it's this is this is actually somewhat of a landmark because we're talking about uh, actually using IPS cardiomyocytes for to fulfill that promise of drug screening. We keep on talking about this in the field. IPS cardiomyocytes can be used for drug screening, drug screening. But this is an example of something that actually worked. We were able to use these cells for identifying an optimized version of this compound, mixilatine. So I think it's the, the first landmark paper in true landmark paper in the IPS cardiomyocyte drug screening field. And I'm sure there are, there are more in the pipeline as well. We're really hitting on all the landmark papers today, Aaron. Let's go. First, <laughs> Let's it was IPS-derived MSCs. Now we're on to this drug screening. I, I, I'm, I, I agree. Um, we've been making these promises. And I, I wouldn't say this is like a half measure by any means. It's a big deal. But now I, I guess we can check this off the list, and I'm looking forward to the day when we cover the paper that's like an open-ended screening, where you take a condition, you have recapitulated in the dish, and then you just dump everything on it, and you, you pick the hits that you never would have thought of, maybe, that are already out there and approved, and drug repurposed, not in, a, in like a, a form or a different variant of the drug or a different chemical structure, that's nuanced, but just like open-ended screening where we can, because that I think is, is you know, it takes you back to the joy of discovery that you have as a child where you just have no idea what you're going to get. You know what I mean? And that's the kind of science I think that makes these tools so awesome when you're selling them. It's like, hey guys, stop, let's stop looking because we're only going to find what we're looking for. Let's throw everything on there and see what nature has to tell us. So I'm waiting for that day, Arun. I hope it's coming sometime soon. That's the thing with drug screening these days, you know, and I'm sure Wes, uh, the authors of this paper, know this really well. The screening libraries that you can actually use for these approaches are just astronomically massive. Hun we're talking about hundreds of thousands of compounds, sometimes millions. So you can really find a needle in a ha haystack if, you're, if your numbers are that high. Yeah, well... That gives me anxiety, to be honest, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess someone else is doing all the heavy lifting there, so I'll just do my thing. Um, well, we're going back to some uh, organoids, I'm afraid, Arun. I got to talk about organoids once in the show, and so here we go. Uh, this is a cool story. You know, we, we always talk about Hans Clevers, and of course, he's on this story as well, but um, it's more of like an engineering mashup to me uh, that is it's, it's tweaking, tuning the system. And it's based on this idea that organoids, that's kind of, we, I think we surrendered ourselves to the organoid. We said that nature can do it better. And, and that's kind of what you hear over and over. You put these cells in a dish in 3D and they make themselves. You know, we talked to Serge Pasca about it. He just took two different organoids, put them together, and they made these assembloids. So there's this idea that nature has its way, but it, it's a bit restrictive, right, because it doesn't allow us to put these organoids into any kind of 3D matrix. Um, and so they kind of stochastically develop 
uh, and have a, a closed architecture that's based on the limits of, you know, oxygen diffusion and the media. Um, so that restricts the lifespan, the spot size of these things, and it prohibits, and here's the real key, it prohibits homeostasis, okay? So Matthias Lutov, uh, also Hans Klevers was second to last on this, Matthias from Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, and what they did here is they generated this unique scaffold with the idea that it would be permeable to gases, nutrients, and macromolecules that would also uh, facilitate um, efficient adhesion and proliferation and differentiation of, in this case, they were looking at intestinal stem cells, but also, and this is a key, that it'd be stiff enough that it could serve as a physical barrier so that you could shape these things. You could make these precast shapes um, and that they would, uh, the cells would occupy them. And, and the way they accomplished the shapes and it was making a matrix that was a hybrid of type one collagen, which was kind of the stiffness and ad adhesive substrate, and matrigel, um, which is kind of soft on its own, but it has uh, all the key growth constituents and it has a lot of basement membrane ECM in there. So the combination of those two into hydrogel, then they integrated that into a, a perfusible microchip type thing that had a central chamber where they could load that hydrogel and the organoids. And it was flanked by this inlet outlet reservoir where you could load cells in there and then you could also have luminal perfusion. Um, and then they had these lateral reservoirs where they had growth factors. And the whole thing looks like if you kind of have like an overhead view of like a horses in, in their stable, you know what I mean? With all the little stables and a central path down the middle, have a look at the paper. But the real thing here is that it, the structures were beautiful and they, they form these nice tube shaped epithelia with this accessible lumen and that's the key. And the way they arranged it, the way they shaped it in this corral-like structure, those little stalls of the horses, so to speak, were the, the, the equivalent of a crypt and villus-like domain. And because these things were perfusible, it allowed them to continuously remove dead cells, which prolonged the tissue lifespan by several weeks. Um, and they could also then colonize these tubes with microorganisms. In this case, they looked at cryptosporidium parvum which no one's been able to model because you don't have the appropriate uh, in vitro model, although I wonder about why organoids wouldn't work, but I guess not. Um, but they recapitulate the host microorganism interactions there, uh, and they also, when they did laser ablation, they found that they could regenerate, and there were special cells that were found in these structures that you don't find in the typical kind of stochastic random organoids. So I think this is a, a nice mashup of like engineering, meets biology, meets 3D, uh, and what they've done here is I think created something, I think this is the idea, is that you create by endowing it with this shape and the structure, you create something that, um, you create an environment that is permissive to cells and processes that wouldn't exist more spontaneously. And the question next is, can, can you apply this to any or every other kind of organoid? Let's see. I mean, the, the first and probably most robust organoid was the intestinal stem cell. We'll have to see if, um, I don't want to say lesser, but alternate cell types can can do the trick as well. Yeah, it's a neat marriage of bioengineering and stem cell biology with organoids. I do want to mention this paper was in review for two years. I mean, ultimately, yes, they did get a nature paper out of it, but... That is a long time. That's two years of your life, man. Uh, props to you folks. But hey, the key here is using form to improve function. Uh, so to best approximate in vivo function, sometimes you have to replicate that in vivo architecture, that in vivo form. And that's kind of what you're getting here with these cryptovillus like structures. So it's it's a point that we've come back to quite a bit recently here on the podcast, whether it's using three dimensional organoids or organ chip technologies like what you're showing here. Uh, the key here is organization is critical to improve the functionality of these cells so that they ultimately do mature. Yeah, functionality, I think, being the key, key word there. Um, and you said it, the, this paper was in review for two years, and you wonder if maybe they just kept sending it back. And like, you know, it's not quite the threshold for nature. It's not quite <laughs> the threshold, but they just kept adding more. Like, okay, we'll give you laser ablation. Okay, we'll give you colonization with this cryptosporidium parvum. And they were just, they finally acquiesced 
two years later and said, hey, you made it. So uh, a lot. They did. They show that these organoids can do a lot of things. And I think that's what you're, you're talking about here is the function has been expanded by the form. Yeah, props to their persistence here. I don't think this is something that I could have done, to be honest with you. Last point is actually, um, it, does it surprise you, does it shock you that we're still using major gel so much yeah. in the field of stem cell biology? I mean, I use major gel every day. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I'm not exactly hating on it, but it is a gamish. It is a mix of random stuff and we've been using it forever it works it works but don't you think we should start shifting more to like a defined substance you know no i mean i had to smirk when they were like you know we need to find something that we can control these things with and so we're going to use type 1 collagen and then we're going to use this completely undefined substance that has tremendous batch to batch variability here we go <laughs> so yes i here agree with go. you but uh you know there's been a lot of groups i think and companies that have been started on this pillar of creating defined matrix. And I think that the, the expense maybe, or the, the, the technical, uh, com, you know, obstacles there have, have led to some resistance of widespread adoption, but it, it's a necessary threshold. We're not going to get to the, to the finish line if we're using matrix. I mean, you know what that comes from, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> It's a happy mixture of whatever you want it to be. But hey, it works. That's the key, right? It works. If it's not broke, don't fix it. We're going to wrap things up with a transitions nicely to our guest today, uh, Dr. Valier. It's, uh, it's along his, it's in his wheelhouse of, of naive state, naive pluripotency. Um, the title of this paper is Reprogramming Roadmap Reveals Route to Human Induced Trophoblast stem cells, trophoblasts, very important. So this is coming from the lab of Jose Polo over there in uh, Monash University in Australia. So there's a, there's a, this is basically the result of an international collaboration involving Monash University and Duke NUS. And they've actually found that you can make induced pluripotent uh, trophoblast cells, which, you know, this suggests that you might be able to make placenta-like tissues in, in an in vitro setting. And of course, you know, iPSCs have been around for 15 years now, but you can't make these placenta tissues from iPSCs. They are, um, they're not at the, they're not able to produce trophoblasts. So this is this is really the the bottom line is they're able to identify uh, tr induce trophoblast cells during the reprogramming process and you're able to cultivate them expand them and potentially use them to make placenta cells. Uh, they did a ton of single cell analysis to actually validate the cells that they're getting. They actually have a you know a single cell website that they produced so you can go there and follow along and you know play along with their single cell results. Uh, the cell doesn't first need to acquire a primed pluripotent state to actually reprogram into the naive state. So this indicates that reprogramming to the naive state is not a it's not a reversion of the developmental pathway. Uh, and finally, and something that they alluded to here at the very end of the paper, which is just setting up, uh, just setting up the next step in this field, the inevitable next step. So they mention in this statement, because both embryonic and extra embryonic lineages can now be derived. Of course, they're referring to the, the placenta-like tissues. These results also hint at the possibility that there may be a totipotent state during the reprogramming process. Totipotent, we're talking about the, the zygote, right? So potentially during the reprogramming process, you might be able to get to that totipotent state. So if the conditions that you can use to stabilize these cells and uh, you know define totipotency criteria are met, then perhaps that holy grail would be become available in the next few years. You might be able to finally isolate and maintain a totipotent stem cell. Of course, inevitably, that's going to create a massive, massive onflux, influx of ethical issues, right? We're talking about maintaining a zygote in a dish, but hey, maybe it's possible. Partner, you call that the holy grail? That's the unholy grail. That's the, <laughs> the, the Star Wars, Clone Wars uh, grail there. But um, I mean, I, I see where you're getting at. And I think that that was a irresponsible bomb that they dropped there at the end of the paper. But hey, that's just, I mean, I'm not a conservative guy. So if I'm saying it's irresponsible, then you got to check yourself. But um, let me stop. It's an amazing uh, piece of work. And I think that the reason why I was a bit rubbed 
by that is because they're already treading, I think, in precarious area. And the fact that they didn't demonstrate any function, like um, to show that these had some invasive qualities or anything like that, I think shows the fact that they understand the implications of generating a trophoblast stem cell. You know, you combine that with an mm -hmm. induced pluripotent stem cell, you're getting a kind of induced kind of blastocyst correlate there, right? So that's a big deal. Um, so you got to respect the ethical issues, as you said. And even the idea, I mean, you're going to have to explain it to me. What's, why? Why do we want a, a, a zygote? Like, what's the upside of totipotency? Is there things that we'll be able to do apart from cloning that, that we wouldn't be able to do with the, the tools we have? I mean, I'm just asking out loud because I haven't yeah. thought it through. Yeah, I think when it comes to, you know, the science, it's, of course, you know, as a scientist, you want to be able to complete that biological circuit. You want to be able to have all the pieces to the puzzle, mm. you know, but of course, it, it's not just as simple as that, right? We're, we are inevitably talking about potentially cloning. We're talking about having the whole organism with potentially the full capacity to, to develop in a dish. So this is, like, you know, I talk about this a lot. There's a lot of really great reasons to be in stem cell biology. Um, I think this is one of them because you can have some of these discussions and you can have the potential to have game changing discoveries that can really, uh, you know, to take a sci fi term, change the course of human evolution. Mm. Right. I don't know if we're, I'm taking it a little too far, but if you're able to get a zygote in a dish, that's what you're, that's what you're doing. Right. Brave new world, unholy grail. Uh, but hey, maybe we'll bring that to Ludovic. He can weigh in. Uh, before we get to that, I got a message from Stem Cell. Take your human pluripotent stem cell cultures further with M Teaser Plus from Stem Cell Technologies, the most widely published medium for feeder free human ES and IPS cell maintenance, is now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility. M Teaser Plus reduces medium acidosis for more stable cultures all weekend long. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash mteaserplus. Pretty soon, I'm thinking stem cells are going to have that zygote media, huh? Rune, what do you think about that? Hey, man, it's not up to me, but who knows? Maybe it's uh, it's in the works. Stay tuned. Maybe it's, maybe it's going to be on our next podcast. Maybe you know this is just a back-to-back -back paper, and they're just waiting for it to drop. I don't know. Whoa, doggy. All right, let's get to uh, Ludovic. All right, guys, today on the show, we have the special pleasure of welcoming an old nemesis of mine, and we'll get to that, Professor Ludovic Vallier. He's a professor of regenerative medicine, also leader of the IPS core facility at MRC Cambridge Stem Cell Institute. Ludovic, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, the pleasure is ours. So, yes, I alluded to our, our history. You probably don't know this, but I, I became aware of you during my dissertation at uh, Rockefeller University, where I was in Ali Brivanlu's lab. And there I was grinding out my first real work studying the requirement for active and nodal signaling in the maintenance of pluripotency of human embryonic stem cells. And you dropped essentially the identical story around the same time as I did. Um, and I just oh. remember, yes, yes, I'm yes, that guy. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we went head to head. on paper. Yeah, okay, yes, yeah. We, we went head to head. Yeah, we published it up on biology. That's true. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you remember, in those days, um, that was everything, right? It was figuring out the recipe for maintaining human embryonic stem cells without feeders or conditioned media. That was the key. That's what everyone was after, the holy grail. That's true. But then that got solved, uh, pretty true. much. Um, and in the meanwhile, you've only gone deeper into the signaling matrix that governs pluripotency. So I have to ask, what drives your continued interest in that puzzle? Um, and is there really a solution or are you just going to go all the way down the rabbit hole? Oh, um, so no, that we, we did. Yeah, so that's true. We know we, um, we did a lot of work on the uh, active nodal saying pathway in human prepotent stem cells and shown with other, you know, including... Uh, you, Ali and you, uh, that uh, this this thing pathway is, is key to uh, maintain the the prepotent state, state of of you know, uh, of human uh, ES cells at the time and, and then human IPS. Um, so we we still doing a lot of work on this um, mechanism uh, in terms of more look, trying to understand how all this pathway can not only maintain prepotency but also induce differentiation because of course you no know, active nodal is also a key signaling that induce underdam differentiation and. 
drive uh, differentiation you know, of, of human problems themselves. So we're trying to understand how this mechanism can have this kind of apparent contradictory function in, in self-fed decision. And we're looking much more in molecular mechanism now, of course, because the tool we can access now have changed incredibly in 15 years now. I remember that we, we were you know, doing chip seek, uh, one of the first group doing chip seek on SMAT23, but now you know we're doing single cell chip seek almost. So, mm. um, and and so you now we, we're looking at uh, interaction of uh, those uh, transcription factors. I mean, the downstream transcription factors of, of TGF beta, uh, with epigenetic regulation, um, we're looking uh, also you know, at much more complex regulation with um, a post transcriptomic regulation, or, and also SMAT to three integrate a lot of different cellular mechanisms uh, because we think that in fact you no know, SMAT to three the main effect of acting in other thing pathway is directly a, a hub of, of uh, different uh, cellular mechanism that goes from. Uh, uh, epigenetic regulation, but also uh, genetic stability uh, and, and of course, cell cycle regulation. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to, to link all of those together. We have a very specific interest in cell cycle regulation, actually, and try to understand all cell cycle control uh, you know, uh, and interlink self decision. Mm. So, Dr. Vallier, you know, in addition to pluripotency, like you were just alluding to, your lab is focusing on differentiation as well, and differentiation into endoderm in particular. And of course, as you mentioned, we've come a long way in fine-tuning the signals that actually control endoderm differentiation. All stem cell biologists still know that there's variability in the process, right? And your lab actually just published a study in cell stem cell that probes this variability a little further in the naive state, so these naive state pluripotent stem cells. And you show that genetic background actually plays a dominant role in driving these you know phenotypic variability during the differentiation process so can you elaborate on this for us and if line-to-line -line genetic variation is an issue how do we go about picking the best pluripotent stem cell lines for our differentiations um, no that's a, that's a very uh, important question so no, it's been a kind of a uh, um, Kind of project that's been ongoing in the lab for the past 15 years because you no, know, we we know and everybody that are using human propellant stem cells you know know that you have a lot of viability between lines, meaning that you no, know, you can grow uh, 10 different uh, human ES or human IPS, and they will have slightly different you know behavior in terms of uh, proliferation and more importantly in terms of capacity of differentiation. So you will have always good lines for, for example, underdam differentiation or a good line for mesoderm differentiation and so on. And what, what just you know, an interesting point is that, of course, you no know, H9, which was the first human ear cells derived by Jimmy Thompson you know, in 1998, has remained the line that most labs have been using for the past 20 years because, by it's a good line for differentiation and it's a very stable line. And in fact, a lot of other lines that were derived subsequently were not as strong. So, just an example of you know, how that uh, started to shape the, the field because, by it, you know, I, I will say that the vast majority of results have been generated on, on one line because of this viability. So no, we, we've been interested in that. And so we know we, we, we of course, know uh, that was ex ex true with human ES and become so much obvious with human IPS because of the sheer, sheer number of lines we could derive. And uh, my lab started to derive the first human IPS in 2009, 2008. And we got no, very quickly dozens of lines in culture and realized that no, we had no a number of lines that were differentiating very well, and another and but a lot of lines also that were not differentiating that well, and especially in two hundred there. And and so we decided to investigate that a bit more. And you no, know, there, of course, there's been a lot of uh, discussion on epigenetic memory, uh, abnormal reprogramming, and so on. But it became very quickly obvious for us that in fact lines derived from the same patient have tendency to be at the same. So like you know, if you derive five lines from the same patient, even from different cell cell type. They will likely either be good or bad, but they obviously be behave the same. Um, so that leads us to think that probably you no, know, the problem was coming from the what is you know, common between all those, those lines, which is the genome and the genetic background could have a key role. And so you now we developed a number of collaboration after that with Daniel Gaffney at Sanger and and Oliver Sanger and other people uh, to likely uh, start to demonstrate that indeed you no know, the genetic background could have strongly influenced first the transcriptome, so that was the work with Daniel Gaffney. And then after, you know, we had the chance to be part of this massive um, initiative in the UK called IPSKI, where we derive IPS line from 1,000 patients, LC donors. 
And then all the lines were, you know, have been deeply characterized by uh, Damophilian acid, cheap seek, and so on. And that's created a massive data set that, again, no, the common denomination of all the variability between these lines were, again, no, the, the genome and genetic background. And with this number of lines, we were able to identify, you know, even EQTL that could control the expression of key prepotency gene like OCT4, you no. Know? So, which, you no, know, again, we think demonstrate that basically the genome have a massive impact on, on the behavior of the cells. So now, and after, so I think that's quite obvious now that the genetic background is a mature source of influence on the behavior of the cells. That it's an interesting quality, so it can be seen as a as a default because, of course, no, that means that every single line is going to have slightly different behavior when you cross them in vitro because of this genetic background, and that's probably we limit in some aspect no um, personalized cell based therapy. No, the idea to have a personalized cell based therapy is is more challenging because, by you know, we know that there's no universal protocol of differentiation, so you're not going to have a protocol that works with all the lines you have in the world. And uh, also know that, but that means that for large scale drug screening can be a bit more complicated. Um, because that's mean again, no, that by uh, each time you're going to model disease or no, do, a, do a drug screen, the genetic background is going to have a huge impact on your readout. Of course, that's also an advantage. That's mean that you can use IPS to study human genetics. And by you know, that now you can do GWAS using IPS. And that was also part of the objective of the IPSCI project, to generate a collection of lines that can be used to you know, by identify genetic variants that can uh, you know, be involved in disease at the cellular level. So that's no, that's that's where we are. And after now, of course, we have been looking at solutions, trying to solve the problem. And one of the solutions is by of course, no, and that was no promoted by a lot of people in the field that no, maybe using uh, IP, I mean, proponent stem cells with a, a more kind of um, you know reprogram or reset epigenic state will be easier to differentiate. Okay, because that will mean that by you know you eliminate one source of variation, which is the epigenetic uh, background. And no, that's what ground state mouse hair cells are, and that's what ground state human hair cells are supposed to be. So basically, we decided to check now that uh, indeed, if we reset the epigenetic of propellant cells, uh, they can maybe, again, in terms of, uh, no, can decrease their viability in terms of differentiation. And for that, we went back to the mouse because that's the best system to look at ground state, you know, that's where you have the standard well-established. And uh, in collaboration with the Jackson lab and uh, Laura Reinhardt and, and, and Stephen Munger, we've been able to derive, you now we use a mouse cells derived from different genetic background and basically show that uh, even when they are grown in the ground state condition, they you know, still show a, a very high level of uh, viability in their capacity of differentiation. So, which means that no resetting the epigenome is not going to be sufficient to really erase viability between lines. And again, that no genetic is 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 the lead, which is not surprising for people for geneticists and no people working on genetic, which is always more difficult for development biologists, mm. um, because in fact no, of course development biologists you know the embryo as a whole and and what our data suggests is that no every genetic background will have slightly different mechanism or at least variation in regulation during development and that's a, a concept that is no is really important uh, that's mean by the you know you have a lot of uh, flexibility and you no know, subtlety in the mechanism that control uh, the development and it's it's much more viable probably than what we imagine and that genetic is controlling that um, so that that's no that's for the, the, the product picture of course no the question is now is what 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 do we do and and the key message that I usually give on that is that no we we need to to understand how different session works that's the key okay if we want really to be able to control those genetic mechanism we need to have a deep understanding of the mechanism that control different session that's probably the only way we can now give a protocol that no accustomed for each lines no that that's really basic knowledge is it, it will be extremely important to derive protocol that are more efficient and a better understanding of of no development biology is, is important and all those genetic variant control uh, this viability also will be key right we talk about um you know just listening to you i i, I feel like the more we've learned the 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 less confident we are that we can reliably differentiate cells with fidelity and precision just because the more inputs you have especially in a human system and different background 
the very solution there in the IPS that solved one problem, right, which was the immune barrier there, introduced another problem that now every single cell line you in, in therapeutic you generate, you need an independent IND for it, right? Um, but nevertheless, we're in this era now of kind of organoids, and we're, we're pushing the limits. I, ne I never thought, I never imagined that we'd be this far so quickly in terms of generating complex tissues um, from the, the rudiments, uh, with limitations, of course. But, you know, I think we've come a long way, and, and it really is, is it particularly relevant, the conceptual events of the distinction between naive and, and prime pluripotency, right? Because the idea there was that the naive or ground state cells would have an increased scope of differentiation, as you just alluded to. So in a real practical terms, are there certain in this era of organoids, as I say, are there certain tissues that you can envision that we would be able to make with naive cells more readily um, that we wouldn't be able just any examples that are kind of low hanging fruit, things that we could do with naive that we can't do with the prime? Yeah, I think no. That, don't don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, no, the no naive and prime state have, uh, are both very interesting model system at the end. Naive, no, currently are really interesting to study pre implantation stage and especially you no know, specification of extremely tissue and probably also you no know, uh, PGC specification. I mean, germ cell specification. So clearly, you no know, prime state and are going to be really important for those aspects. Then you no. Know, what we are called conventional human prepotent stem cells are, are no better to study uh, early event of differentiation in um, no castration and germ layer specification, I think. Mm. Because likely they're really the last stage before those events and they're really representing those stage. Now we know now that uh, likely no, when we use differentiation in one cell cycle, the cells become mesonderm, for example. So really they are the, they don't do any intermediate prepotent state, they differentiate. And, and I think no, in terms of Modeling this this um, aspect is 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 clearly a very good model. So in terms of basic research, no, both systems are, are quite useful and have no really strong interest. Um, after no, for clinical application, I think again, um, uh, no, the the discussion is still open on that. Uh, no, I think currently, clearly, human ear cells, no, human IPS derive uh, in the no in the conventional prime way. Are the cells that are you no know, used in the clinic? That's the one that you no know, are going for parking, are going to for clinical trial in Parkinson for for you no know, um, uh, cardiac regeneration for for MSCs. For example, there is you no know, paper published in Nature Medicine today on on MSCs uh, derived from human uh, ES cells. So, you no, know, the right is that those cells have been here for a long time. There is a lot of validation. There are you no, know, we have put a robust protocol to differentiate them. We have a lot of experience. We know their limitation. We know their advantages. So I think no, those cells are, are, are here and, and they are already useful for the clinic. I think there's still a lot of work to do on ground states, uh, you no, know, to to really bring them at the same level in terms of confidence and, and ap application, clinical application. Mm -hmm. But again, I think no, at the end, it doesn't matter. Is is to use the best cells for the for the job, actually. Okay, and no, ground state could be also really relevant. Uh, no, with more validation. So, Dr. Bellier, we're talking a lot about endoderm on this podcast and between pancreas, liver, gut, and so on. I actually think it's the germ layer that we're covering the most on the show. And the other thing that we're discussing a lot is organoids. So we'll focus on a pretty important paper of yours that just came out in the journal Hepatology. You actually showed that in vitro cultured human biliary organoids are pretty transcriptionally different from the primary tissue that they're derived from. And when it comes to human gallbladder organoids, they're actually conserving only a limited number of regional specific markers corresponding to their location of origin. So even if they're in perfect, what might these gallbladder organoids tell us about the tissue specificity of diseases that affect the gallbladder? Okay, so that, that's a no, very vast question. Uh, first, that's great that uh, no, underderm is the main jam layer that you discuss <laughs> in, uh, in your podcast. No, that's that's my, my favorite jam layers too, so that's cool. Um, so, okay, so this paper in hepatology, what we did is, yeah, it's compared to by derived no, uh, what we call a cholangiocyte organoid from different region of the BI tree, which is you now this uh, system that likely uh, drain the toxin out of the liver and, and bring it into the gut. And there is different region, gallbladder, common bile duct, and tripatic. 
And we know that those different regions express different markers and there's a regionalization. And it's important because in the, the disease affecting the BRH3 uh, are region specific. You, know, you have regions that ex affect the intrahepatic or the extrahepatic, and su su suggesting that you know you have uh, specific mechanism, uh, regional mechanism of susceptibility. So we decided you know, to try, okay, let's see if we can, when we derive colonial from those different regions, if we preserve this regional identity. And what we observe is that, uh, no, directly when we grow cholangiocyte, no, we directly lose this regional identity. So they're still cholangiocyte, no, they will express all the marker you can find a cholangiocyte, but they will lose this uh, regional specific marker. And uh, now, of course, is it surprising? In a way, not entirely because, no, we always have a bit of a naive way of looking at things we grow in vitro, but clearly, no, we can't expect that the cells grown in vitro will be absolutely identical of the cells grown in vivo because there is no in vitro environment that will absolutely ident reproduce, no, identical environment niche than what you have in vivo. Nobody can reproduce the complexity of you know, the, the biliary epithelium with all the cells, the matrix, the, uh, the, the, the surrounding uh, system. And what we think is happening is by actually, you know, you have a lot of environmental clue that you lose in vitro, and so you lose this regional identity. Okay, that doesn't mean the cells are not interesting. It just means that you 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 lose this identity. And what is interesting now is that we're using you know, those cholangiocyte organoids to try to identify what are those environmental clues. You know, or we can basically re-specify each organoid in different regions by just adding you know different uh, uh, factors that could help to uh, define. You no, know, we we basically redirect those cholangiocytes into a for example, gold bladder or common bladder to intrahepatic. And I think that's really going to help us also to identify directly how those maybe clues are also interfering with the susceptibility to disease. Because once we understand you know, which are the, the factors that are directly uh, regionalizing the BRE tree, we can also understand what are the downstream mechanisms that make those you know, regions susceptible to specific type of disease. So that's no, that's what we are doing. But clearly, you no. Know, the the message to take home is that when you grow an organoid, no, um, it, it it it's not absolutely identical to the cell type, the origin. Doesn't mean it's not the same cell type. It just means that you're growing them in different cultural conditions, so you will observe differences. But it's true with any in vitro system. You need to understand what are those differences. Yeah, I always wonder about in vitro is how many near misses there are, right? So you talk about the microenvironment and people are growing all these cell types, but they're not really manifesting as the cell types of interest because they haven't put them into the microenvironment. I wonder how many pseudo organoids that you could put into an organ and then they would be endowed with uh, the traits of that uh, organ that isn't in vitro. I mean, that's a kind of a rabbit hole of a question, but it brings me to this fascination I have with, with your deep interest. I mean, you, you've been really tremendously productive in two arenas, pluripotency and endoderm, that could each on their own make, you know, many professorial careers. So why, why do you carry both of those interests so closely for the, you know, decades now of your career? Are, are you invested in pluripotency mainly as a means of achieving faithful, efficient, and or precise differentiation to endoderm, or you know, you're just interested in it as an academic basic, uh, you know, passion of yours. And also, this may be a dumb question, but what do you think is more complex from a signaling perspective? Is it harder to maintain pluripotency, or is it harder to differentiate? Oh, that's a lot of question here. Okay, so <laughs> first, uh, why? So what is important is that, no, I think we work on pre-potency and self decision. If you look at our track record, okay, it's where we generated a lot of new knowledge. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's where we have a deep understanding. And in fact, no, if you, my intellectual participation, I think, has been many on this field. No, it's understand basic mechanism that control pre-potency and self decision. And I think if you look at our papers, yeah, no. No, you look, for example, the um, M6A you know, methylation, the, the paper on cell cycle, and no, that's new knowledge, that's new mechanism. I think that's really important. The work on endoderm so far, no, I've been more developing, using this knowledge to generate protocol for producing cell type with a clinical interest. We did a lot of that, by actually. Okay. Here, the knowledge is practical and technological, but not less, less basic and no, less fundamental. 
And I think, you know, both, I'm excited by both. I'm excited to generate, you know, understand mechanism, generate new knowledge. But I'm also super excited by tr- finding application of this knowledge and transferring that, you know, uh, further, you know, and, and make that, I don't like the word useful, but tr- transfer that, to have a kind of societal implication of the work we do. And, and I think the un- under them differentiation is, is there. Um, what we, of course, now trying to do more is to start to use the, all those in vitro systems we have developed over the years to understand new biology, to generate new biology. And that's really, you know, and I think it's a key challenge for all in vitro systems currently, you know, that we are using from organoid to, to, you know, to IPS and other is really now using the system to discover new biological mechanisms that are, you know, relevant for in vivo development or for disease and, and so on. And that's really a you know, key challenge. But that's, that's what we're trying to do you now is to less focus on the technical development, more focus on, on, the, on the fundamental question and, and, and new knowledge, even with the under them. Hmm. Um, after, you know, I think the, the, the key question is, is you know, how long we can, uh, in my opinion, the key question for us now is how long we can sustain to manage two branch of research this way, mm. because simply of you no know, funding aspect is a key challenge. So, for example, the permanency aspect is very difficult to maintain in the lab. So you talked about the the double edged sword of stem cell biology. There's of course so much basic science and basic discovery that's still you know, there to uncover when it comes to the mechanisms of pluripotency and differentiation and so on. But I think, you know, part of the the allure of stem cell biology these days is like you mentioned, the translational applications, right? And in particular, the translational applications for IPSCs, which have, you know, been around for about 15 years now. So you spearheaded the creation of the Cambridge Biomedical Research Center's IPSC core facility, the main objective of which is actually develop in vitro models of disease on demand. And to date, the platform has actually derived around 400 IPS lines for set from 70 patients. It's been about 15 years since IPSCs were first derived, right? And now there are dozens, maybe hundreds of different core facilities and biobanks around the world, similar to yours. And in comparison to the early days where it's like pretty easy to make IPSCs these days for academic purposes, and there are even commercial kits available now that can reprogram these cells in, in a matter of weeks. But there's still certainly room for improvement in the reprogramming process, right? Especially when it comes to reagent costs and whatnot for freshly making the IPS lines. And I think this is one thing that's slowing down IPS therapies from making that clinical and translational jump. It's still kind of expensive to make these cells. So in your opinion, where can we make improvements so that IPS reprogramming and technology can be accessible, not only to academic labs and powerhouse academic institutions, but also to translational and clinical interests as well? Okay. Yeah, just just to precise, you know, the, the number of cell lines you mentioned for the IPS capacity is more or less what we derive per year, but not in the last 15 years. <laughs> I just want to say because you no know, 70 lines in uh, in 15 years, it looks like, wow, guys, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Important clarification. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so, okay, improving your uh, reprogramming. Okay. Um, wow, that's a tough question because to be honest, right now, um, no. We can derive IT IPS line from almost you know, any patient and from a lot of different cell type. It's expensive. You no, know, um, it's expensive. I think for for me the, the I'm 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 I may be disappointing on the answer, but for me the the reprogramming is not the challenge. It's still no. Or we have a global standard to grow those cells uh, and to differentiate them. And, and no, the, the key challenge is here because the truth is that no, we, we can definitely derive hundreds of thousands of IPS line. The problem is that no, there's still uh, so many different methods to grow them, so much divergence with lab that make a lot of things complicated in the field and very difficult for everybody to compare results and even to sometimes discuss about the same thing. So I think for me, the, 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 the challenge is no, it, and the cost actually are more on the subsequent use of those lines rather than the, or the way you generate them. Uh, because, you know, the methods that are available now that have been using, it, to be honest, there's not been a, any evolution in terms of free programming for past three, four years, four or five years. No, right now, everybody's using Sendai or no Episomal or no something uh, equivalent. And because simply, you know, all the 
I think all the, the improvement have been incremental. Um, didn't improve the quality of the line in sense of viability. And the problem now is that, you know, when you're on that with 10, 10 IPS aligned in your lab, that means that already you have five postdocs that are very busy. Okay. So, you know, it, 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 the, the problem is not really on the generation of the lines. It's how you can use them after that and how you can make something useful of with all those lines. That's a key challenge. Hmm. No, I think I would argue that it would be better to generate less lines than to use them you know, more efficiently after that. We need to generate more postdocs, huh? Got to reprogram huh? some uh, grad students directly in a postdocs, perhaps. Um, <laughs> a postdoc or PhD student, I have no problem with <laughs> <laughs> his post. So. Oh, man. Uh, so, yeah, I think what you're kind of alluding to here with the funding and, you know, the, the, the research program, the number of questions seem to multiply with every answer, right? Um, so it seems like there's other paths, right? And you've been quite active uh, in the commercial sector as a founder of multiple biotech companies. I speak to some academics who feel like it's the only way to get any discovery into people, into the clinic, is to step outside of academia, to step outside of the strictures of the university where everything's cumbersome and maybe it's a regulatory. I don't know exactly what the problem is. Um, you probably know better than I. Uh, so tell us, like, what is it about, or maybe it wasn't for you, is, is that what drove your decision to go into the commercial sector is they, in order to, to bring your, your um, idea into to a therapy, into translation that you had to get outside of academia, or is it just a, a, another avenue that you took for a different reason? Yeah, I think, no, the main motivation was that um, I wanted to see what we generate in the lab use outside the lab, actually. Okay. And um, we we wanted to to buy key. we couldn't generate products. No, that's not our job. We couldn't generate this model for uh, pharma. We couldn't uh, no have even no the production of cells for you no know, large quantity and these kind of things. That's that's not our job. We're not we're not by key, uh, no, uh train and, and, and mentally prepare even for that. So by key, you know we we still wanted to have an impact you no know, outside uh, the academia and 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 see our research going you no know, beyond that so i don't think the goal was to bypass that it's just that the variety of things that we couldn't do it ourselves you no know, and and that we were not um, you no know, we were not able to do that because it's simply not our job and so uh, creating a biotech like Definigen was really an opportunity to see, you know, all the IP we generated over the years, all this knowledge and being used in a different context and, and no, trying to bring added value on research. And, and as you know, I don't like this word, but being useful in another way, hmm. um, not simply in generating knowledge. Um, and, and I think, you no, know, it's true that, uh, some aspects are, are a bit faster in, 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 you know, in, in the private sector. But some other aspects are more complicated also. So I, I don't think it's no, it's it's a way to escape academia. It's just a, a way to uh, you know use your research in a very different way. Mm. Um, I think you know in academia we generate knowledge, we generate new technology, we you know progress, uh, we, you know general kind of science aspect. Uh, we're not there to commercialize. No, even industrialized process and these kind of things. No, I, personally, I, I'm very bad at that. So that was no the best way to do that was through a, a, a biotech company. Yeah, that's the exciting thing about being in science these days is you can have a foot both in the academic and the the biotech side of things as as you're currently doing. So you're of mm. course a leader in the United Kingdom life sciences community, and you've been pretty outspoken about how the current political climate around the world and in the UK in particular has presented somewhat of a, a dangerous situation for biomedical research in the UK. And I'm, part, I'm alluding to Brexit, of course. And it's not just about the funding, right? It's about the ability to actually collaborate and train in science freely across Europe that's being impacted. So now that it's actually been a few months since the Brexit ruling and since the, the start of the pandemic, how has your lab and your institution been able to adapt to this so-called new normal? And as a broader question, how do you think the realities of this pretty wild year in 2020 is going to change the future of stem cell biology and research in the United Kingdom? 
Uh, I will say that 2020 is the worst year ever. Is by key. Uh, I can't. I can't swear on the, on the podcast because no, <laughs> uh, I've I've rarely seen in my life such a disastrous year for so many reasons. Um, so yeah. So Brexit first. Okay. So Brexit at the moment we don't know what the reality of Brexit is because it haven't really happened yet. Okay. It's going to be massively problematic for the UK research landscape for many reasons for funding. You know. We're going to lose a lot of access to uh, EU funding. So my lab, for example, has been funded at uh, 70% by EU grants so far. Hmm. So you know, what are, are we going to function with EU grants? I, I don't know. Uh, it's also you know, in, going to impact the diversity, the connection. Uh, it, it, it's no, it's, it's going to be truly difficult. For example, no, I've been recently contacted by an Italian uh, master student who wants to do, uh, you know, to come to the lab for six months next year. And she needs a visa. That's the first time. You know? uh, just until now, she just has to turn up and uh, you know, and, and she was in. Now she needs a visa. We'll have probably to, have to pay the visa and we'll have some complication beyond it. So, no, it, it, it's it's going to be tough. It's very difficult. And, and no, it's, it's self-infected. There is absolutely uh, no kind of you know, good reason of doing it. And that, no, it's extremely frustrating. But no, I, and no, we on the other side of the pond, you have your own problem. So it, it's it's a, it's going to be a tough time for the kid. The, the pandemic, of course, is 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 uh, is uh, is also really damaging because I think with the pandemic, you no, know, we had hoped that the economy will uh, you know sustain the the shock of Brexit and the government had, had a clear vision on, on you know how to fund science. We don't know what is left of that now because the economic shock is going to be so huge. So no, it, it's 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 not a great year for sure. No, and the impact is going to be felt for several years. And no, there there is a big concern. So no, how long that's going to last? What are going to be the consequences? Um, it's, it's complicated. Uh, so no, let's hope that uh, the the next election in the U.S. Uh, bring us uh, the only positive news of the year. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I was going to say at least we can hope for a, a new administration to, uh, new you know. Yeah. yeah, because no, I, I think the same. No, the, the yeah. So I think you no, know, don't get don't get me wrong. What is frustrating is the UK has been doing so well in research. Mm -hmm. It's been you no, know, it's clearly one of the, if not the best country in Europe in terms of research because of funding, because of culture, because of quality of training, and so on. Why will you damage that? Yeah, well, I have a feeling that if your 70% of your funding comes from the EU, the UK is not going to be so attractive to, you know, some of the scientists that are at the pinnacle of their field. So, I mean, UK would be smart to do something about retention. I'm not saying you should go somewhere else, Ludovic, but hey, I know a lot of people would have you. If we get Trump out, maybe we'll uh, make some space for you over here in the US, huh? <laughs> you have to 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 see that uh, a lot of European scientists in UK know. I mean, there's been two school. I think two two situational. There's been the European scientists that have you no know, embraced the situation and decided to take their British nationality and you no, know, will stay. You know, whatever happens. Hmm. And then you have another group of EU you know scientists that have looked at the situation and say, no, uh, we need to see what's going to happen, but. And have a backup plans, frankly, hmm. and no, uh, or at least have a plan, uh, you know, if everything that we fear happens, happens, basically. I mean, no. Well. I, again, no, well, my motivation is, is, no, is, is, is to do science. No, I came in the UK to do research because I was the best place to work on human ear cells at the time, you know, hmm. because it was forbidden in most, uh, uh, EU country at the time. Uh, and no, I came here to, to do that, if I can't, you know, oh, it, it's it's no, it's it's difficult. Yeah, no, it's it's your life. You know, you can't yeah. live without your life. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's it's a it's a sour note to uh, end the scientific discussion on. But I'm I'm hopeful that uh, things are going to take a turn. You know, I, some people are so looking at the the this the current times with dread but i feel like it's a big wake up call and this is the nadir of our human existence i think in all of our lifetimes so it's you know it's got to go up from here i think it's always darkest before the dawn and all the other clichés um and uh 
you know, idioms out there. But let's end the scientific conversation and go a little peripheral, if you don't mind, Ludovic. I want to ask you a couple of questions that are off the scientific menu. What's a, what's a non-science or science peripheral book that you're reading or have read that is awesome and that you would recommend? So, I mean, um, so I'm, I'm a bit science fiction fan. So, you know, I'm, I, I read a lot of uh, SF book but the, the the author that i always loved and like you know is dan simons uh, uh, and no i will recommend on uh, hyperion and andemion to mm. to read uh because no a bit more complicated than the average sf book but it's beautifully written and, and i think it's a beautiful story there's so much of uh, things in those books that relate to the current situation i think so it's good oh that was my first favorite book i mean that that sold me on side for the shrike remember the shrike Oh, yeah, so exactly. haunting. <laughs> and such a great modus, too. The first one, Hyperion, the way each chapter was a character. Well, oh, great, Greatest book series, I, in my opinion, in all of sci-fi. Read it, people. Um, and next, we're going to do some fill in the blanks. So starting with the biggest thing in the stem cell field right now is? I think I will say it's, it's organoid. But I will, I will say also is to uh, uncover new biology with organoid and IPS. That's, that's the biggest thing. Yes, agree. It's a whole other dimension, right? Literally, I would never have gotten to this point in my career without. Oh, Roger Peterson. Hmm. The man. He was last author on that paper you went head to head with me. So he's my enemy as well. The both of you. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's a beautiful man. So no. Right. Maybe a beautiful man, but we're going in a steel cage match. I'm. I'm going to take. I'm going to take him down. Um, when it comes to blank, I am pretty much useless. Oh, mathematics. <gasps> I think it's a, it's an important message, okay? I'm I'm an absolute disgrace. I can't I can't understand number. I, no, even my bank account is, is useless <laughs> by key. But I, I think it's a message also because no we we're living in a world where you know genomics, coding, blah 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 is so important. But we also you know always in the line diversity and we need different type of intelligence. And I think my intelligence is not on mathematics. And no, it's 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 handicapped a bit, okay, uh, but it, it's no, it's also a strength. So what I, I'm, the message here is that no, we have a diversity of intelligence and we should embrace all of them. Even if you're not good in maths, you can succeed. I like that message because <laughs> my my weakness is geography. My wife will tell you she, I barely know north from south. So yes, I embrace that. Think of me not for my weaknesses. I can't find my way uptown. Um, okay, finally, if the lab catches fire and I have a chance to grab one thing on the way out, it's my... Oh, God, I will have seen uh, my closest colleague or something you know, that is, is, is part of my team. But um, if it's an object, uh, I will say my laptop. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I know it's disappointing, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's basically my life. <laughs> no, I know it's how a it safe is. answer. Yes, it's, it's a good a answer. Safe answer. <laughs> Even though we're all backed up in the cloud, somehow we're attached to that tablet. Um, but you can say your colleagues. You can bring your colleagues out with you. I mean, they would probably... Yeah, that's that's what, I, of course, that I will do. You know, I, I really uh, uh, love my team. And I have to say, you know, I've been a bit negative on the pandemic, Brexit things. But, um, you know, I've been very lucky to have the people in my team. Uh, we've been in, doing very tough time this past few months. And they've been solid. And that's that's really important. No? Uh, and uh, I think if I had to believe that something, it's the belief that, no, my group will uh, will pull together and that we'll continue to go, do great research in the in the next few years. Yes. Amid all we've lost, I think we're really reminded of all the things we have and all the things we've gained. Yes, Arun, Arun, who just had his first child. So we're yeah, winning. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I'm awake right now. Somehow I'm awake. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, don't know, I don't know how you're going to tell your child you you born in 2020, which was basically Armageddon. <laughs> hey, it's it's one bright spot in an otherwise know, not so great yeah. year, right? So yeah, yeah well, yeah, he will have a lot of things to put on his T-shirt. Now, born in 2020 at the same time, then <laughs> that's going to be on this, on this list. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the COVID generation has begun. Anyway, uh, it was a really fun conversation, Ludovic. Thank you so much for joining us and, uh, you know, for, for being my aspirational nemesis for my entire career. I've always looked up to you and your scientific endeavors. Thanks for talking to us now, and thanks, you guys, for listening. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.
That brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. You know, Arun, it's been 20 years since my the seed of hatred for Ludovic Vallier was was planted. And now I finally met him. He's the nicest guy ever and so fascinating. We should have been friends a long time ago. We're going to keep this going. Uh, Stay tuned, guys, for the next episode coming back at you in a couple weeks. And thanks for listening to this one.